Welcome to Season 5, Episode 5 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Marcy Bagel on how to prevent bullying in the classroom. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. This episode is sponsored by theteachertoolkit.com, a free website with over 60 teaching tools designed to make instruction engaging and meaningful. For each strategy, you'll find step-by-step instructions, editable templates, and even video footage from real classrooms to show you the strategy in action. To check out these free tools and the growing collection of affordable online courses, visit theteachertoolkit.com. So today I'm talking with Dr. Marcy, as she's known. Dr. Marcy is a child behavioral specialist, and she's the author of the book, Love Your Classroom Again. She's also the founder and director of Behavior and Beyond. I was introduced to Dr. Marcy's work when I heard her speaking about bullying prevention on a local news channel here in New York City, where we're both based. And I'm really excited to have her here as a guest on the podcast to share those tips and information that she has with you all as well. So let's get started. You can listen in as Dr. Marcy and I talk about ways to prevent bullying in the classroom. Marcy, I want to start by defining what bullying is and what it isn't, because I feel like bullying has become sort of this catch-all term that people use whenever anyone says anything unkind. They'll just say, you know, he insulted me. He's a bully. But that really downplays the potential impact of actual bullying. And I think it's really important to understand the difference. So can you start by talking to us about that? Definitely. And I think that this is a really important topic because bullying has become so generalized, yet not to the huge degree that the term is being thrown around. To actually be in a bullying situation or dynamic, it's ongoing. So it's not one instance of someone being mean or someone being in a bad mood. It's an ongoing experience of negative behavior between the same two people around the same topic. Um, And often it includes an action that they're getting them to do and a perceived imbalance of power. So sort of the very stereotypical thought of the kiddo that is going to steal your lunch money and comes up to you and says, give me your lunch money. And then the kiddo who's being bullied saying, okay, here, as if they have no other choice and this happening every single day for three weeks at school, that's bullying. Right. So it's really centered around the imbalance of power is what we're talking about here. Yes. But to me, I want to specify that it's a perceived imbalance as opposed to an actual imbalance. Mm. No, that's right? good. Because, yeah. I think for a lot of small children, they don't get that just because this child, other child who may be bigger or more popular or, you know, whatever the ramifications are, more something than them that they don't have to listen to them. Right. Whereas they don't, the truth is there is no, it's not the same as listening to your teacher. Hmm. That's good. That's really good. I think every teacher can think of kids who seem to always be the target of bullies. What can we as teachers teach our students about how to respond to bullies so that they can prevent themselves from being a target? I love this question because what I have experienced is that lots of children who have been bullied are pacified. They're allowed to talk about it as much as they want. They're told it's not their fault, which it's not. Let me be clear. Um, And just are allowed to, in some ways, spin out in their own anxiety around being bullied. And to me, that is really unhealthy. If they had an experience that was hard for them, let's talk about it. Let's address it. And then let's teach them the skills to move on for it, from it and get past it. Or better yet, let's teach our kiddos to not be bullied in the first place. Because there are specific kids that get targeted repeatedly throughout their life and even into adulthood. I know some adults who are still in bullying dynamics because they allow themselves to be in some ways. To me, the way that you really change that dynamic is teaching kids when they can say yes, when they can say no, and what their strengths and weaknesses are knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are, who you really are in the world is how you have good self-esteem. When you have good self-esteem, someone can't bully you. So for me personally, I'm, I'm short. I've always been short and no one could bully me around that. Cause I know it it's to me, it's just a fact. It's not something I'm ashamed of or feel bad about. It's just who I am. 
So if someone were to walk up to me and go, shrimp, you're right. You're taller than me. Uh Uh-huh. I don't give the bully any response that is interesting or that would make them come back for more because there's, there's no reaction. Whereas if you feel insecure or unclear about the fact that you're short, you try to defend yourself, you tend to fight back, you give a big emotional response, and that's really satisfying to all of us, right? We're all looking for a big emotional response, and it tends to allow bullies to come back. That's a really good thought about, I want to sort of go back to the piece that you said about how they're not victims. Like we don't, not that they're not victims, but that we don't want to train kids to perceive themselves as victims and to keep replaying that story to themselves where they are the continual target. I really like that a lot and really embracing um, who you are. What else can kids do to, to stand up to bullies? What should a child in our class, what should we advise them to do if they're being bullied? To me, bullying is an attention-seeking behavior, right? Behaviors only have a couple functions. And when a child is bullying, they're looking to get a reaction. They're looking to get a response. So the best thing you can do when someone is saying something unkind, saying something mean to you, is not react, which for small kids is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. So the best advice that I've given kids is walk away. If somebody is talking to you in a way that doesn't feel good to you, walk away from that person. You're under no obligation to stay there. And if there's something bigger going on, as in you're being bullied while you're doing a group project, or you know the teacher has assigned you a partner and they're being mean to you, then talk to the grown up. That's that's why the teachers are there and express what's happening, and and why you need something different. Because the more we can get our kids to tell us in that factual base, as opposed to being devastated by it, the more empowered they become because they have a way to change their environment. How does this play out for kids whose culture um, or home home environment sort of teaches them that walking away makes you, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, kind of makes you a punk, right? Like you don't just walk away and you also don't snitch because in some communities, that's sort of the ultimate, um, that's like the the worst response to you don't want to tell an adult and you definitely can't walk away. You have to stand your ground and fight. How how would you advise a a child who uh, that's, that's the norm for them? Right. I think that that is a big piece of just addressing cultures overall of, is that really the message that we want to teach our kids? There's a difference to me between standing up for yourself and fighting back, right? If someone Mm -hmm. comes up to me and says, you're short. And I go, I am with full confidence, secure in the fact, because someone has taught me that, that I am short. It's just a fact. It's not something to feel bad about my you know, my family will talk about it. I know that this is just who I am and that's okay. Or, you know, growing up, I was really bad at spelling. Someone goes, you failed your spelling test. And I go, I did. Hmm. And that to me is standing up. Mm -hmm. I don't have to attack you and say, well, you're ugly if you call me short. And that to me is where the breakdown starts. And when it goes from bullying to a fight in which both kids are then going to get in trouble. Right. Exactly. That's what we, we want to make sure we prevent. What do we do about these kids who, who are doing the bullying? Because I find that the stereotype of like the bad kid bullying the, you know, the good kid, you know, and I put the, mm-hmm. that in, in, in quotation marks, <laughs> for sure. That's not yeah. quite accurate. Because many of the kids who have a tendency to bully others are often I've found to be quite tender hearted themselves. They have a lot of really good qualities, but there's also a lot of pain and a lot of misplaced aggression happening. So how do we put ourselves as teachers in a place of empathy so that we can get to the root of the problem and prevent those bullying behaviors from taking place? One of the core messages that I teach everywhere, which applies to bullies here, is that there are no bad kids. There's just bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And so any label that you're going to put on a child that starts to define who they are or that you start to think of them as who they are, they start to pick up that identity. So a kiddo who is bullying is not a bully. He's having some problem behavior that we need to address. And if you as a teacher maintain that framework, you'll be able to address that behavior. But if you start going, oh, they're just a bully, that's all they are, that's all they can be, then that kid starts to identify themselves as that and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the first step as adults is to really say, we have some problem behavior that needs to change rather than labeling the child. 
Right. And even, even if you're not saying that out loud, because, you know, that's what teachers, you know, that's what we tend to think, right? Well, I'm not like telling the kid that they're bad, but you know, when you're thinking that, when you're thinking this kid is such a pain, this kid is always in trouble. This kid never makes the right decision. He's always bullying other people. And you keep thinking about the child in your own mind and and telling yourself that story that the child is a bully. That's going to naturally be reflected even just in your tone, in your word choice. You know, I mean, I, I can think of instances where I was sort of playing those types of stories in my mind. And then what I did was I overreacted to the behavior. You know, the kid would just look at someone funny and I'd just like jump on them for it. And that's because I had sort of framed that kid in my mind as he's a troublemaker. And I, that did a lot of damage. That's, that's something that I think a lot of us, a trap that a lot of us as teachers fall into. Yes, it's, it's exactly what the problem is, is that if you have defined a kid a certain way, then when that child and another child come up and say, well, we got in a fight and he hit me and she called me name and da 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 you automatically already decide without actually knowing which kid was at fault. And that might not be true. There have been a lot of classrooms that I, you know, I sort of get to sit back and watch what's happening in classrooms as part of my role at times. And what I see is really wonderful, caring teachers look at their classroom and happen to catch the bad kid, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. doing something wrong and yell at them. They get in trouble. They get kicked out of the classroom. But three other kids did the same exact thing. The teacher didn't even notice it. So the stories that we tell ourselves really do impact what we start to see. So you want to make sure that you are defining the behavior and what you're seeing and moving from there. Because the other thing about that is that then you're going to start to figure out, well, why are they doing that? Bullying is all about getting attention. So why is that kiddo trying to get attention in this way? Can I teach them to get attention in a better way? Are they missing social skills that they don't really know how to go be friends and want to build a friendship and they're doing that? You will come at that child and teach them very differently than if you label them as a bully. And if you're constantly looking for what positive you can teach that child of how to change that behavior, then the sky's the limit. And you can literally in one school year with one child change their entire future. If you come at them from that perspective. What about cyberbullying? I feel like one of the most frustrating things for schools is that a lot of bullying is happening after school hours. It's happening via social media and those sorts of things. And so that's really out of the jurisdiction of principals and teachers. So what should a teacher do when we're told by parents or by students there's bullying happening, but it's happening on students' own devices during their own time? This is one of those times where schools and parents really need to come together and get on the same page about what what is good and what is bad, and then have ongoing conversations with their students, with their children about technology and about social media. I think that many children don't quite understand what's happening in in the cyber world. And so they end up saying things there because they think it sounds cool or their other friend did it or everyone else was saying this. And they don't understand the impact they're having because you're not sitting in front of the child who is receiving that needing to watch their, the impact it has. It's, it's removed enough. The thing to me about social media that, that we as adults, I think struggle with is that we are creating personas that we're putting out to the world, right? My, I I'm on Facebook. You can go look me up and I have met people who I don't know in person, but have found me on social media and they meet me and they talk to me like they know me. And it's a little bit strange at first. Cause I'm like, how do they, Oh, right. They know that I was on vacation because they saw the photos. Right. Okay. This makes sense now. So we have created personas, whether it's intentional or unintentional that we're putting out into the world and teaching our children that that's what they're doing and that you want to represent a true and accurate face of yourself out in the world, which means if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, you shouldn't be saying it online. If you wouldn't talk that way in front of your parents, you shouldn't be saying it to anyone online and creating rules and dynamics around that. And then having that be a continuous conversation. It's not a one shot deal, right? It's an ongoing development of, well, what do you say now? And especially as kids go from elementary school to growing up into middle school and maybe being interested in, in dating and relationships, talking to them about how to use social media in appropriate ways that way is also really important because it totally changes the dynamic. How do you tell somebody that you like them via social media, which is really what so many of my families are currently facing? 
Mm-hmm. I love it. Marcy, I could talk to you all day about this topic. This is so fascinating and you have so many great insights to share with us. We do need to start wrapping up and and I'm I'm hoping that you can tell us something that you wish every single teacher knew about preventing bullying among students. The biggest thing that I can say is that it's a classroom-wide challenge. It's not just between two kids who are having a challenge dynamic. If you as the teacher show up as a leader for your class and say, we treat people in this room with kindness and define what that means, and we support each other and we raise each other up, then you will be so much less likely to have bullying in your classroom because children will feel safe and seen and supported. And be the model of that and then teach all of the children in your classroom to do that so there won't be any space for them to bully each other. Hmm. I know you have a lot of resources to support teachers with that and to help them be that leader in the classroom and and lead by example. If teachers want to learn more from you, where should they go? So there are two main places. One is I have a, a book that recently came out called Love Your Classroom Again that you can go on Amazon and get it. And it is short, sweet chapters defining exactly how to combat some of the most challenging behaviors you're facing. And then come to my website, it's behaviorandbeyond.net. And all of my resources there, links to all of my social media pages are there. And there's just, you know, you can sign up for my blog. I send out weekly insights for you, just a wealth of information, because I think that teachers and parents understanding behavior goes so much further in the day to day lives of children. Yep. That's great. I always close out the show with what I call the takeaway truth. It's just this short but powerful sentence or quote that I want teachers to remember in the week ahead. Can you give us a takeaway truth for this week? I would love to. What an honor. (laughs) All behavior can change. If you remember that all behavior can change, you will always look for a way to change it and that you know that it's possible. And over and over again, I've worked with teachers and parents where They thought it was impossible. They had tried and nothing worked and we found a way to change it. So always know that it is possible to change. All behavior can change. Change Mm -hmm. is always possible. I love it. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Marcy, for being here. And thank you all for listening. Have a great week. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth For Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.